Yes, yes, yes! I understand, you guys cannot get enough of soldering-related content. And while at least for the near future I had nothing of the kind planned, apparently nobody cares about a good video on making an LED lamp, and much more about desoldering electronic components. So, here you go. Since I already exhaustively covered making your own soldering iron replacement tips, I figured why not turn the tables and this time around make the soldering iron itself, in which you can put the DIY soldering tips. So here's the plan, we're going to build a real soldering iron, no not this kind of crap, nor this one, but a real actual soldering iron to replace the, quoting a comment, crappy cheap single heat soldering pencil I've been using for the past almost 9 years. By the way, congratulations Richard for being able to even afford anything else than a crappy cheap single heat soldering pencil, and sorry for picking on you. Either way, it is definitely a good idea to finally replace this soldering iron, because for some reason all the outlets on the second floor of this house are not grounded, which means if this crappy cheap single heat soldering pencil had ever suffered a ground fault, it would have had a pretty shocking result. Leads me to conclude that this soldering pencil wasn't that crappy after all, and at 20 bucks it certainly wasn't cheap. Which may literally have been my lifesaver. Anyway, let's build a new one. The first part I'm going to fabricate is this long, not so shiny anymore section where the heating element resides, and to do that I'm going to use this piece of 10mm metal tubing I got from a broken clothes drying rack. To be honest, I would have preferred an 8mm tube because the old soldering iron is 8mm in diameter, but I don't have the right diameter tubing, so we'll go with that. It's probably also quite adequate because as opposed to the 15 watts the old soldering iron is capable of, the new one will be able to go up to 30 watts. I'm always blown away at how well standard household scouring cream works for polishing metals. It gets so smooth and shiny. Making the next part is much more tricky because it should be made from either brass or copper, neither of which I have a sufficiently big chunk of, plus having a metal lathe would be kind of important, but I don't have one so I gotta work around all these drawbacks. So instead of brass I'm going to use this piece of 10mm iron, which I have proven to be a very bad heat conductor over in this video, and to turn it I'll just abuse the drill press as usual. First I need to drill a centered hole, which in itself is not an easy feat on a drill press. This hole is where the soldering tips get clamped in later on. Then there is a lot of shaping, shaping and more shaping, first with the angle grinder to remove the bulk of the material, then with the Dremel tool and finally the file. I really hope this conducts enough heat to the soldering tip since it's at least only a very thin layer, but as soon as I can get my hands on a piece of copper or brass, I'll immediately make a replacement out of it. The only other choice would be aluminum, but I ultimately decided against that because to reach a maximum temperature of 400 degrees Celsius at the extremity of the soldering tip, the heating element would be dangerously close to the 660 degree melting point of aluminum, and having the soldering iron itself melting as soon as I heat it up is definitely not my goal. Well, I think it's safe to say I just successfully machined a nice shiny metal part without ever touching a lathe. It did make a huge mess, it also used up quite a bit of the cutting disc on my angle grinder, but it's more than good enough for the job and the way the new soldering tip slides into it is just so satisfying. In terms of precision, it's naturally not mind-blowing. This section here is a little bit triangle shaped because I used the file too uniformly, apparently I shouldn't have done that, and it doesn't quite fit into the tube yet. Though that's mainly because there's a weld inside the tube, so I'll clean that out next. My goal here is to get a nice friction fit, you don't want to have to hammer it in or it might split the tube during heat up, but it shouldn't be loose either because the only thing to hold it in place will be the set screw for the soldering tip.
With the end cap fitted, I can go ahead and measure out where the set screw will go, then carefully drill and tap the hole. Now, I usually don't praise my own work, but this thing is so darn nice and shiny that it'll almost be a shame to heat it up for the first time and have it all discolored afterwards. Okay, now we have something that looks incredibly alike the front end of a soldering iron, maybe because that's what it is, but in terms of functionality, it still leaves a lot to be desired, notably the ability of getting hot. So it's time to think about how I'm powering this device, and since like I said earlier, I have no ground connection on all the wall outlets upstairs, which is where my electronics lab is primarily located, hooking it directly up to the grid is obviously a big no-no. After all, we don't want to replicate the problem we're just trying to avoid, do we? So I looked at all the transformers in my collection and settled on this old-fashioned beast, which putting out 30 volts at 1 amp is easily capable of delivering 30 watts. I don't rightly know why an electric typewriter would need that powerful of a transformer, nor do I know whether it's actually rated to put out 30 watts continuously, because the markings on it make no sense whatsoever, but considering common voltages in consumer electronics, I think it's safe enough to just assume it's a 24 volt rated transformer, which implies I'm still in the save zone, loading it down with 30 watts. That's how you do it, if you don't know the numbers, just invent some and hope for the best. Anyway, via trial and error I figured out that I'm going to need exactly this length of this 26 gauge nichrome wire from an old blow dryer to consume 30 watts. Fun fact, this piece of nichrome wire is the very same I used in the fan heater for our dark's candle. Since the dock had to be put down after my dad ran him over last year, I disassembled the fan heater again and here is the heating element, reused a second time. Remember, reduce, reuse, recycle. As you can see, this configuration draws about an amp at 30 volts, which in fact equals 30 watts. The heating element gets easily hot enough to melt solder, but doesn't quite start glowing red, which is probably what we're looking for. We'll see. First, I need to take this thing apart again though, that's gonna be a little destructive for the threads, so I'll have to clean those out afterwards. For the insulation, I'm just going to put a piece of fiberglass sleeving over the skinny stem of the end cap. And yes, technically this fiberglass sleeving is not really the right stuff to use. I believe commercial soldering irons use something quite different, because this is only rated up to 500 degrees Celsius, plus it's coated in silicone, which will likely burn off in a very smoky, very smelly process. So I'll keep in mind not to do that first heat up down here in the workshop. Since, like I said, the heating element was already used prior to this, I'm going to lightly sand about 1.5 inch on either end to remove all the oxides before twisting it together with equally treated pieces of 26 gauge enameled copper wire. Now I can start winding it on the core, first two turns of the copper wire to fasten the starting point, then the nichrome. And while everything looked fine so far, here is where things went downhill very quickly, until So yeah, what happened there was, while I was winding, the nichrome wire got hooked on the tripod and pulled into one of these super annoying tiny loops, and while I fumbled around one-handed trying to untie it, the wire snapped. Because nichrome is brittle. So that's screwed, that's for sure, though to be fair, all stretched out, this piece of nichrome wire was way too long to fit on there anyway, even if I had wound it tight enough to touch everywhere, it would've probably been too much. You see, it's kinda difficult to do a coherent video on something I've never done myself before, while simultaneously planning far enough ahead to not do something I might regret later on. Next attempt, I still have this 32 gauge cancel wire I bought on AliExpress not too long ago, so let's see how much of that I'll need to get the 26 ohms the other heating element had. Looks promising, not even 2 feet or 56 centimeters to be exact, that's certainly gonna fit. And now the same again, this time without sanding the cancel because it's brand new and I'm also using two much thinner not enameled strands of copper wire.
Well, that went a lot more smoothly. I tried to wind everything as close to the flange as humanly possible because it just doesn't make much sense having a whole lot of heating down here if the soldering tip doesn't go in that far. The resistance is now 32 ohms because I added a little extra just to make sure the overall power consumption is more like 29 watts instead of the 33 we had beforehand because let's face it, it's much more common to round up numbers than it is to make them smaller. So back to the soldering bench, I got everything hooked up to the transformer, let's plug it in and enjoy the show. Like I expected, it's definitely off to a good start in terms of smoke, but at least up here I can ventilate the room afterwards. And we are actually melting solder! Well, I would consider that a really successful burn-in. As you saw, the soldering tip got easily hot enough to melt solder, consequently it should do very well soldering, but I couldn't help noticing that the heating element does start glowing red very faintly, which I'm not a huge fan of, but I guess I can't change that anymore now, so I'll have to go with it. Anyway, let's put it together and finish up the soldering iron. To insulate the leads, I'm going to slide them in some unfortunately oversized fiberglass sleeving, fold over the lower one and fix it with a piece of steel craft wire. The same happens with the other lead, except I wind the craft wire around everything as tight as possible and twist the ends. Now it's ready to be reinserted in the tube. Carefully line up the holes and push it in, except with all the added stuff it's not as easy anymore so we'll force it in with a clamp. Yep, the screw fits, fortunately, or else I would literally be screwed. The handle's actually already finished because I had to take some flashy thumbnail pictures before discoloring my shiny creation here, so this is just a piece of weeping willow wood I drilled a 10mm hole in and turned on the drill press. Why specifically weeping willow wood? Well, just because we had a weeping willow cut down a few years ago and it's a nice consistent soft wood that takes paint very well. I simply copied the shape of my beloved commercial soldering irons handle because I'm already used to that shape and why fix it if it ain't broke? Plus, it looks kind of classy. On the back, there's a hole for the power cable. Now, before I just ram this thing into the handle without thinking, I need to do some extensive testing to make sure this tube doesn't get too hot down here and start charring the wood, because if it does, I need to drill some holes into the tube to act like a heat break before it enters the handle. So I'll heat it up again, this time for much much longer, to really see how quickly I can burn myself on it. No, seriously, after about 8 minutes it's ready to be used, I don't know if that's fast for a 30 watt soldering iron to preheat or not, but by sliding this HDPE bottle cap along the tube, I can fairly accurately figure out where it reaches the 130 degrees celsius required to melt HDPE. Looks to be around this point. I decided that, to be on the safe side, I wanted to be below that threshold at the point where the handle starts. After running it for an hour, this point has crept farther toward the end of the tube as things reached maximum temperature over time. I can now burn myself literally everywhere on the tube and it solders really nicely too. This is going to be one beast of a soldering iron. Honestly, it's almost scary to see how quickly and effortlessly it chars paper. So yeah, definitely needs a heat break. The walls of the metal tubing I used are just a bit too thick to lose enough heat over the distance, and I usually don't feel like setting the house on fire. This test wasn't only about figuring out whether I need to drill these holes or not, but actually a stress test for the entire thing to see how it holds up, to check if the transformer can be run at 30 watts over prolonged periods of time without overheating, and of course to see if the soldering tip burns through after just 5 minutes. Which luckily it didn't. And even though everything performed well, it's worth noting that I usually never need a 30 watt soldering iron, so this is going to be turned down to half the power most of the time. If I wanted to always use it on full power, I would have tested it for at least 3 hours continuously, but then I would also need the real mica foil insulation underneath the heating element as opposed to the fiberglass sleeving I used because the fiberglass is definitely going to break down over time at these temperatures. 
I did some more testing, drilled another set of holes, and now it's what I consider acceptable. There's also two additional small holes down here to accommodate a nail, which is going to act as a key to prevent the iron from twisting and sliding out of the handle once this washer is screwed into the recess. Because I'm pretty certain the wood will further dry out and shrink over time, being in direct contact with the hot iron, so we don't want it to fall apart as soon as I pick it up a year from now. Anyway, let's put it together, I can't wait soldering with my homemade soldering iron, made from a broken clothes drying rack and a cut down tree. First I need to feed the cable through the hole into the handle and slide, or rather force, the washer onto the tube. To insert the nail I need to push the fiberglass insulated leads out of the way and that's where the holes I just drilled come in incredibly handy as I can just insert the center punch to make way for the nail. Then tinning the lead wires and the cable. Snip off the excess and solder everything together. This tiny zip tie should be sufficient as a strain relief, after all I'm not exactly gonna lift a cow with it like some weird peasant. The cool thing about this design is that I can even skimp on the heat shrink tubing by simply tucking the ends of the cable into the fiberglass sleeve, though that means I need to be constantly pulling on the cable at the same rate as I push in the metal part to prevent the solder joints from slipping out of the sleeving. I admit this is quite difficult, worsened by the fact that the tube really fits quite tightly into the handle, but so far so good. Last thing, I just need to screw in these screws. And that's it assembled! Now one thing I'm noticing with the yellow paint, it's very susceptible to dirt that somehow sticks on the paint, so maybe that wasn't the best idea. But, apart from that, I'd call this a solid soldering iron. Cue the soldering montage! And that's it for this episode! This thing is by no means finished, obviously. I don't think I mentioned, but in the end it's going to be an entire soldering station with temperature adjustment and everything, so in the next part we'll build the electronics to control the power going into this thing, and in the last episode it'll get a nice enclosure and whatnot. I hope you enjoyed, I'll see you next time. Now please go and watch the LED lamp video or I'll be really sad, because it was a very good video and nobody cared. Go click it, now! Haven't you clicked yet? Click it!